Good evening, dear brothers and sisters. A uh, very warm welcome to our WESA special Dharma Talk series, Compassion in Action, Peace and Nonviolence in Buddhism. Tonight, we are very privileged to have Ajahn Jayasaro here with us to talk about the Buddhist perspectives on peace and nonviolence. So can we actually use force for the sake of peace? Buddhism has widely been perceived as a religion of, of peace and compassion. And in fact, uh, the Buddha condemns violence in every form. The ongoing war in Russia and Ukraine has affected many people and torn many families apart. And we mustn't forget about the civil war in Yemen, the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, the border disputes between India and China, etc. All these have sparked many different opinions and emotions amongst us. So the question I ask myself uh, before uh, the talk, the session today is that how do we actually realign ourselves with the teachings of the Buddha? So Ajahn Jaya Saro is one of Thailand's most renowned Buddhist monks and meditation masters. And we are very, very privileged to have Ajahn here with us today. Um, if all of us can um, join our palms together to pay respect to Ajahn. Good evening, Ajahn. Um, let us begin. I'll, I'll start with, um, with my first question. So how this is going to work is that me and uh, I'll, I'll be interacting with Ajahn and asking some questions, but just some housekeeping rules before we start is that uh, I hope that you all can remain muted throughout the sessions. But if you do have any questions, you can type into the chat or you can type it into the uh, Facebook or the YouTube comments and then we can um, ask on behalf um, to Ajahn. So um, my first question is that Ajahn, can anger be a positive emotion and can violence be a positive action? Um, short answer, no and no. Um, so okay. I'll, I'll expand on that. So um, anger is an emotion that is always, in every case, based upon ignorance. It's an emotion that arises from ignorance of the way things are. So in a uh, clear vision of the way things are, there is no, um, there's no possibility for anger to, to arise. The um, anger is based upon the idea of self and others, and as practice develops, the boundaries between self and others um, change, become more fluid and are no, no longer solid enough to sustain um, anger in any form. In, in Western culture, um, then there has uh, long been a debate on the um, possibility of anger as a positive emotion and the idea of righteous indignation um, has played a part in theology and in general debates and, and is in the mainstream of the culture and the idea that I see that we see today is that in the face of overwhelming odds, overwhelming injustice in which people feel helpless, vulnerable, without power, that anger is the only emotion that will sustain any prolonged opposition to injustice and um, cruelty. So anger as a motivating force for those who are faced with almost hopeless odds or 
um, overwhelming um, cruelty. That idea is, I think, um, generally accepted, and the idea that there are some kinds of anger that you should hold on to, that they are valuable, and that without that anger, you would become prey to despair. So anger as an antidote um, to despair, I think that idea is quite widely accepted. I wouldn't accept it myself um, from what I understand to be the Buddhist position. The um, fueling your anger, uh, feeding your anger, cultivating your anger for whatever reason that they are is ultimately self-destructive. And that, and without that, that anger, the angry mind is a very to coarse destroy. mind. From angry mind sees things in terms of right and wrong, black and white, us and them. And so um, we'll almost inevitably simplify what are in almost every occasion uh, complex situations, uh, situations that have arisen through a web of causes and conditions, and that the angry mind is unable to tease apart, to, to investigate the causes and conditions of violence and oppression and to deal with them wisely. It's, it's, um, it's like a big hammer approach. It's not in any way a subtle or nuanced um, approach and one which recognizes what can be done, what can't be done, what needs to be done short term, long term, and so on and so forth. And the, the angry mind is one which will very easily compromise on one's moral standards um, and ideals. And um, before long, then, the distinction between um, the, the right side and the wrong side gets lost. Because if you, um, once you, you accept the possibility of acting immorally for a moral objective, then you'll find that your opponents um, probably um, are working on the same assumption. They might seem to you to be completely immoral, but in their own eyes, they are probably um, believe themselves to be acting morally. And this same idea of um, acting immorally for ultimately moral results is the you know, is the root cause of the uh, the longevity of so many conflicts around the world. So I, I would say that um, as far as the second part of the question and mm. to to violence and is violence. Um, acceptable, then I, I would say that from the standpoint of the suttas and the teachings of, of the Lord Buddha, it's quite clear this, there can be absolutely no justification for, for violence. It is always bad karma to act violently because the intention is key to kamma. If the intention is to hurt or to harm, then mm. kamma is created. Nevertheless, the, the question that I think is sometimes overlooked is, is, is to say, well, what does it mean to be a Buddhist nation or to be a Buddhist individual? And for uh, most householders, then they have multiple identities. This is to say they have identity as a Buddhist, but also identity as a, um, a subject of a country, 
they have identity as parents or as children, as spouses, as mothers, fathers, etc. And that it's not the case that at every moment of the day, their Buddhist identity is the primary identity. And in, in, many, um, in many situations where there is a danger to family or a danger to the uh, integrity of a country, then for householder, even householders who identify with, if you were to ask them what religion do you profess, they would write on a form that they are Buddhist, but their identity as being a Malaysian or a Thai or, a, or, or an English person would take precedence, would take priority over that, or their identity as being a mother or a father who has to protect their children would take um, precedent over their Buddhist identity. Mm. So, in I did a, I should look a, a little um, poll of some of the lay Buddhists that I that I know, my students, and and put that question to them. You know, just how um, how absolutely pacifist they would be if there were threats to their country or to their family. And these are these are genuine and committed lay Buddhists, but they they would admit that if there was that kind of threat, then they would be willing to compromise on the first precept. And I think this is kind of normal for householders because they they have not made that total commitment to the the threefold training that a monastic has. Mm. So certainly it's clear cut for a monastic, you, you would die rather than commit an act of violence. And, and that's part of the commitment you make, the renunciation you make to become a monastic. Mm. But there's a recognition that that kind of standard is not one that most, most people are, are ready to make. So as a, as a monastic, you're not saying, well, it's all right. Yeah, I understand your position. And therefore, because you're committing violence in a, in a uh, good cause, it's okay. I mean, it's bad karma. But you, the, the role of the monastic, as I see it, is to remind people of the Dharma principles. Mm. But at the end of the day, the every individual has to make their choice. And in some cases, um, lay Buddhists will make the choice to say, well, I don't feel I, um, that, that I can keep that precept right now. Mm. Um, and, you know, as a monastic, you say, well, you're not a Buddhist anymore, you know, kick you out of Buddhism. You say, recognize the, the conflicts that um, lay, lay Buddhists face in the world. Can I just ask uh, to, well, this actually leads me to ask the next question, but before I, I thought I asked that, I, I, I would like to know, because just now Ajahn was saying that we, well, we shouldn't really use anger as a fuel to our helplessness or situation, but as uh, the disciple of the Buddha, how can we actually, how should we feel uh, ourselves when we are faced with injustice? Well, Buddhism has a very um, uh, profound, subtle teachings on, on motivation and wholesome and unwholesome motivation. And uh, we, dis we distinguish unwholesome motivation or craving or tanha from wholesome motivation, which is called chanda, or sometimes dhamma chanda, or kusala chanda, but for short, we just usually use chanda. And, and that distinction is um, often completely misunderstood or overlooked in, in Western treatments of Buddhism, particularly of uh, unsympathetic representations of Buddh Buddhism where the idea is that Buddhism teaches that we shouldn't desire anything, that desire is bad, and if you desire anything, you're 
you suffer, therefore you should try to find a state of no desire. But that's quite a, um, a serious misrepresent misrepresentation of the Buddha's mm. teaching. Mm. The Buddha said that we replace um, dhanha craving, the unwholesome motivation, with the wholesome motivation. And in the, for instance, in the teaching of the path to success, we call the four idipadas. Chanda is the first of the four idipadas, and it leads to wiriya or effort. So there is a clear link being drawn between the cultivation of chanda, wholesome motivation, and effective effort. So chanda is distinguished by the focus on the action itself rather than on the result of the action. Unwholesome desire is focused on the reward or the, the result rather than the means by which that result is obtained. Mm. So, for instance, someone working with motivated by tanha would be primarily motivated by the desire for, uh, for wealth, for um, status, for power. Whereas someone working primarily motivated by chanda would be concerned with doing the best job they can, enjoying their work, um, developing their skills in their work. And so the, the focus is on the means rather than the end. So there is, there is always going to be a need for motivation, but the, the idea is to channel as much as we can into the wholesome stream of, of chanda and as little as possible into dhanha. So motivating oneself with anger is definitely on the side of dhanha. It's, it's unwise motivation. Whereas chanda is recognizing something that needs to be done. And one's, uh, one's motivation is to do what we can do as best we can, given our, our circumstances. So it's on, the, on, on that sense of I'm doing what I can. I'm doing the best I can. That, that's where you find your, your energy and your, your motivation. Mm. Mm. Rather than Thank saying, you, you, yes, sorry. Okay. Oh, I, I, I was just going to lead on to my uh, next question is that, um, so what, what can we do? That there are two anger to this um, sort of question is that, as a citizen and as a leader, what can we actually, because we've talked about religion, um, the identity and the, the intention as well, but what can we do um, as a citizen or, or as a leader when our country is, is oppressed or, or, or treated with, with violence? Because the, I feel like there's a bit of dilemma here because if we fight back, it goes against the teaching of, of ahimsa or, or the non-violence but then if you don't fight back when people invade our country uh, in a way we are passively encouraging um, violence on, on the other hand so so I just wanted to um, ask Ajahn is there any practical advice that uh, or, or is there a, a better way that we can um, uproot the problem Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, I think the um, probably the the formulation of Buddhist um, approach on on a national or state level would probably be in line with the United Nations resolutions, in which force is considered to be the the last resort and yeah. um, only legitimate in the case of of, of self defence. I think that would be probably the position that most lay, lay Buddhists would, would, would hold to. Mm. 
in mm. positions of, of power and influence. Mm. Um, the, the Buddhist teachings were originally referred to by, by the Buddha himself, either as the brahmacharya, uh, particularly when speaking with, with monastics, or else to the, the dhamma vinaya. So we, we, we often, everyone's familiar with talking about the Dhamma, but not so much with Vinaya. And the assumption is, is usually made that Vinaya refers to the monastic code, um, mm. the rules, regulations, protocols, customs, and so on, that by which the, the monastics live their life. But there is a, a, a wider, more, more comprehensive meaning of this term, vinaya, and it, it means really creating the external conditions which are most conducive to the practice and realization and propagation of, of, of Dhamma. So that includes laws, um, regulations, um, agreements, protocols, customs, um, which all strengthen and facilitate the practice of Buddhism, or in this case, the preservation of peace between nations. So Buddhism is, is not at all a teaching which is uh, exclusively focused on the individual and on the individual's state of mind, but does recognize the importance of the environment, the importance of the social environment, political environment, and that it's taken to be responsibility of leaders to be mm. creating structures which facilitate the peaceful coexistence of nations and or of communities within nations and to minimize the possibility of uh, conflict. So in the example you gave, it's like that's, that's when things have already reached the critical stage in which there's no way out. Mm -hmm. But from Buddhist point of view, we're saying we need to put a lot of effort into more effort into finding ways of preventing that situation ever occurring in the first place. Mm. But having said that, there, there is a, a profound asymmetry between the actions of um, good, kind, moral people and the actions of cruel, immoral people. And an example I often, often give is that if we had a hundred people sitting in a room and we want peace, we want quiet, all 100 people would have to um, participate. Whereas if we wanted noise and disturbance, only one of the hundred wouldn't be necessary. Mm. And if we want to have um, peaceful coexistence between hundred families in a in a village. You only need to have one family of of criminals and and completely immoral people to disturb the peace of a village and in a world community. You see, it's not. I don't think that it's true that the majority uh, of people are cruel and and selfish and and so on. But those that are, have a disproportionate impact on the well-being of the majority. And that's why I, I, I can't see that there will ever be anything we could say world peace. And just from that simple fact that even if you were to reduce the, the, the power and the influence and the number of immoral people or people who wish to act immorally, you're always going to have a problem because they have a disproportionate effect on the, uh, on the majority. 
so in a, in a way, uh, you, you, you're saying that the, the peace between people and, and the countries, they, are, they might not be uh, achievable. Uh, is, that what you, is that what you mean, Ajahn? Or? Well, I, I don't think that peace is achievable, but I think that working for peace and creating as much peace as we can mm. is, is the, the goal that we should work for. But there, mm. there's never been peace, I don't think, in the world ever. Um, mm. There's no. no reason why it's suddenly going to appear now. But there have been major um, advances made. If you look at the, which is the most violent and lawless and, and cruel place part of the world um, until very recently is Europe. Uh, European people are uh, always fighting each other in a very cruel and nasty way. But since the Second World War, there's been no conflict, um, not on a, like a state level, because of the creation of a, of a community of nations, of the, of the EU. So from that, you know, whatever its, its um, drawbacks or its weaknesses on political, social, economic um, angles, then I, I'm not an expert on those, but from the simple point of um, making a huge change in the, 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 the safety and the well-being of European people, it's done a fantastic job. So we can, we can improve things, but I don't think that it's possible that we say, oh, we can develop uh, world peace and that should be our goal and then frustrated that we can't make it because I don't think it's an attainable goal. But I'm reminded of the Mahayana um, Bodhisattva vows. They say like all sentient beings are, are without number, but I will save them all. That's, that's the kind of um, mm. attitude. Yeah, we, maybe we can't really um, expect a world without wars and without conflicts, but we can do our best to minimize them and to learn what are the causes and conditions that um, minimize and, and reduce the severity of conflicts and how can we put those um, structures into place. So that's the Vinaya side. And then, of course, there's the Dhamma side in terms of the, um, the education process given by the, by the Buddha himself. But frankly speaking, there, there's always, even in Buddhist nations, there's always going to be only going to be a minority of people who are really going to um, make, make a serious commitment to that training. Mm. Just, just to, we, we, because we talk about how we could, um, we should be preventing uh, conflicts from from happening that just because um, my, my question is that how, how do how do you think we should spend our national budgets um, to, to better prevent um, future conflicts and violences um, just just you know give a context imagine that all the world leaders are here with us today what <laughs> advice would you would you give in terms of how we should uh, spend our budget to to better prevent um, you know, uh, conflicts and violence, violences from, from happening. Yeah, I'm getting out of my sphere of um, expertise here into giving um, advice to a collection of world leaders. But I, I think that we, we can't ever change anybody. Um, so let's get down to basic principles. Now, one person can't change another person, but we can give them the reasons and the inspiration and the confidence to change themselves. So you know, that's the role of a teacher. A teacher can't change a student, but the teacher can facilitate and help the student to help themselves. And in... Uh, and I would, uh, I would assume this would be the, the same principle, whether it's speaking to, to people in a monastery or people in, in the United Nations or whatever. It's like, um, what exactly is our goal here? You know, what, what, 
what do we want? And um, do I, I would think that that most world leaders would say want the well-being of their people. Um, so let's let's look into that. So how can we create the causes and conditions for maximum well-being in the in the world today? I, th I think that. There is a there is a um, you know a place to be, talk about ultimate principles you know because in in most decision making bodies I think they tend to be very short term you know like a democratic government is has its eye on the next election and so is almost. Um, compelled to think short term because if you put in a like a long term program which just means short term pain for long term gain very few democratically elected governments are willing to do that because they'll get kicked out of government when the people are in, are enduring the pain and then their opponents will receive the the fruits when all the good results come. So this is just inherent in the democratic system of government. So there are always um, difficulties when, or there's a particular way of looking at things when short-term goals are the norm. And that's why there has to be, I think, a stage in which you can talk about values and ideals and long-term gains. Okay, we, we know maybe leaders of a country know what they would like the, the, their country to be, where they'd like it to be in five years' time or 10 years' time. But if we say, how, what, do you, what do you think about 100 years' time? Where do you see your country in 100 years' time or 500 years' time? And of course, then your whole focus has to change because you can't be talking about material things and economic production. But you, when you get into long-term focus, you have to talk about values. And I think that's there's not enough talk about about values. Where I, I would I would say, and I would encourage um, these leaders every now and again just to talk mm. about values rather than their narrow, short-term um, self-interest. Mm. And um, can you expand a bit more about the type of values that we should be um, um, actively uh, discussing about, Ajahn? Well, start off with basic Buddhist observation. We're, we're all subject to old age, sickness, and death. We're companions in birth, old age, sickness, and death. And it's very difficult to, to talk about this without resorting to cliches, but um, the things that unite us are far more um, numerous, far more profound than the things that divide us. And finding the, the links and the connections rather than emphasizing the differences. I mean, I think it's, it's um, shocking that after all the development and the technological developments, I mean, the, the technology that allows us to speak in this way right now, and yet so many, such a huge number of, of people in the world are caught up in prejudice based on color and gender. And, and, and this is like the sort of, ABC of civilization, you know, it's like um, that, that we're still on that level of discriminating on someone just the way that they look or the color of their skin. I mean, it's absolutely pathetic, isn't it? I mean, it's unbelievable that in the same civilizations that can create so much wonderful art and science <laughs> and, that, and that people could be caught up on just what color skin they are. So these, these are things that, that really need to talk about a bit more, you know. <laughs> um, 
how how can we allow this to um, we are, uh, we don't allow it, and there's a lot of uh, discussion about it, isn't it? But we're not doing very well on the very basic um, elements of humane coexistence. So I I would just think that it is surely um, uncontroversial that feeling safe um, is something that everybody desires, that living with people who are kind to you and being able to be kind to other people is superior to people treating each other cruelly and with selfishness. I mean, maybe just establish that. I mean, kindness is, is superior to cruelty. Um, and just start off with, um, with basics because we can't even seem to um, get those things um, down very well at the moment. Thank you, Ajahn. I'm, I'm just um, curious here is that, um, because we know that if we, all, if we all always have the nature towards awakening um, and compassion, why do humans, why do we always react um, with anger and violence instead of um, uh, wisdom and compassion? Is, is there any, anything, at least on a personal level, that we can do day to day so that we can align ourselves back to our Buddha nature? Um, yeah. Well, well, as human beings, our, our, our gift is our capacity to learn and our capacity to change. But our, our human nature is, is, to a large degree, animal nature. We have just the ordinary animal needs for food and rest and, and, and sex and all these different, um, different drives. That's part of being human. And they're very strong drives. So without a training and without a systematic education of our, all our faculties, then our default reaction to um, all the challenges of life is the instinctual, the uh, what we call the defiled um, reaction. So it's it's... Unless you've been trained, it, I think it's uh, obvious that it's, it's easier to be unmindful than it is to be mindful. I mean, nobody just um, is born mindful and just finds it easy. Um, mindfulness is, is um, something to be achieved through training and education. And, and goodness and kindness, we will have um, capacity for those um, those virtues, but they need to be um, raised up as goals. They need to be praised and they need to be taught to children. And then um, they need to be systematically developed. They need to be integrated into education systems. The, so it's easier to be angry than it is to let go of anger. It's easy to be greedy than it is to let go of greed, but we can be free of anger. We can reduce our anger. We can reduce our greed, but it's work. And the question is, you know, how much are you willing to um, put into that work? Is there any um, practical examples that Ajahn can, can give us that sort of what day to day we can do for example to um, you know cultivate towards that side of our nature if you like yeah. well um i think that the the four um aspects of, of right effort that we find in the eightfold path are extremely practical and flexible so the, the first effort is to, 
take care of our mind in such a way that as yet unarisen, unwholesome um, mental states will not arise. And then secondly, in the cases where um, they do arise, then making the effort to abandon, to let go of them, and then making the effort to introduce into the mind, uh, to instill in the mind the wholesome mental states that have not yet arisen, and fourthly, to take care of and to further cultivate those wholesome states that have already arisen. So wherever you are, whether you're alone or whether you're with family or you're at work or you're traveling, you're, there is always um, opportunity for one of those four kinds of, of at least or one of those four kinds of, of right effort. And the, the mindfulness in daily life that, that we need it's, it's not a, like a, a floating quality of awareness. You always have to be mindful of something. And the most fundamental objects for mindfulness in daily life are the five precepts. So you are mindful of the precepts. It's not that you keep the precepts as a prerequisite for the practice of mindfulness and um, Dhamma practice on higher levels, but keeping the precepts is your Dhamma practice in, in daily life and being mindful and remembering them and being able to recall them um, on those occasions where you are tempted or pressured into um, transgressing them. Just to um, ch change the angle a, a little bit, Ajahn. So, uh, if I understand correctly, there, there's there's two levels of the Buddha's teaching: there's the ultimate and the relative uh, reality. But in the ultimate level, the Buddha taught us to transcend uh, duality. But then, in the relative sense, we we do need to differentiate between the good and the bad. So how do we actually apply the, the wisdom of non-dualism when we are approaching uh, social or economic or political injustice? Um, is, is there any practical lessons we can learn from the Buddha himself? Well, to... Um, to I, I think observation constant observation of experience is the key. Constant observation allows us to see how wholesome motivation can, um, if we're not careful, become unwholesome motivation or an unwholesome motivation become wholesome motivation. Um, motivation Let, let's say for instance um you you join a, a charitable foundation or some kind of activist group and devoted to the betterment of society but um after a while you become um attached to the power that you might have in that in that group or you become very um, attached to your opinions and and being able to uh, Im impose your opinions on other people and um, all kinds of ways in which are basically um, selfless and noble intention can be corrupted through lack of self knowledge and lack of self awareness. And we can see this in, in groups of people devoted to good in society, often um, full of disharmony and jealousies and um, egotism. So, so something can start off very well and can change into something not so, so good. Otherwise, some people can, uh, in, in Thailand, there have been a, a time where 
meditation became very fashionable again after a long time and people going on meditation retreats simply because it's kind of cool thing to do um and but then after a few days on a meditation retreat then they suddenly realize oh this is really something truly valuable and so the um rather trivial intention becomes a good intention and becomes a um a wholesome intention so seeing how people's intentions people think can can change um and how the i think that observing yourself and observing defilements in your own mind um very clearly makes you sensitive to them in other people and and being able to see oh yes that person's suffering from that same defilement as me and seeing that that's where the unity comes from yeah it's not like that person's acting in a very obnoxious way and and, and it's a kind of a personal thing but it's it's like that um arrogance let's say is a is like a virus um and i've got that virus ever now i i've had that virus myself and that person's got that virus so you're seeing things in terms of um wholesome and unwholesome dhammas manifesting in people's behavior and because presumably you 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 know you you're not an arahant yourself you're saying oh yeah i i i have that as well you know and you, so there's a humility that arises from that and a sense of fellowship and not um creating this strong sense of us and them so so there is the on the conventional level let's say you're you're in a position of authority and someone is misbehaving or someone is dishonest then you you have to um act appropriately and it might even mean to sack that person if they you know as a last resort but at the same time you have a recognition or oh, that person's just got caught up in that particular defilement they were carried away and so you have that compassion and sense of um recognition of what's really going on here but on the conventional level then sometimes somebody has to be uh punished or in some way or um even uh, has to be um sacked from their position if there if there's no other remedy so so i think i'm just trying to come up with some examples where you're holding the two things together um i mean you're not creating this strong self um i'm good and that person's bad and the the buddha in fact in in the majjhima nikaya talks about the the wise person and the fool and gives a number of examples and he says if you keep the five precepts purely but on uh, on the basis of that you consider yourself superior to someone who doesn't keep the five precepts then you are a fool you're not a wise person so your precepts uh, are no longer pure because you take them as grounds for arrogance or um considering yourself superior to others so there are many of these um reminders but i i i think i would stress the the importance of this observation of what's going on in your own body and mind what's going on around you and and the more centered you are the more grounded you are in the in the present moment then the more you learn um and the that um dis- dissolution or the 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 um the strong sense of self and others starts to fade or to be um dissolved by that awareness in the in the sutta so in the um um 
Is, is there any um, examples that the Buddha himself has, has approached any injustice uh, that we can learn from Ajahn? Or? An injustice? Like, um, sort of how the Buddha himself has approached um, any injustice in the past that we can learn from for now in our modern society. You mean like a personal injustice or... A, a, uh, well, uh, or, or how he has um, solved or, or um, approached any, you know, during his time, any injustice. Um. Well, in, in, the, in the monastic discipline, then there are various categories of rules and transgression of the, the more minor categories, uh, rules within the more minor categories uh, can be resolved through um, confession before the fortnightly recitation of the Patimokha. If a monk commits uh, what's called a Sangadi Sesa offense, then there is a period of um, penance and uh, rehab before rehabilitation. And if a monk acts um, in a way that breaks one of the four Parajika offenses, then he has to leave the Sangha and cannot um, reordain as a monk in this lifetime. So in terms of transgressions and, and misbehavior um, amongst the Sangha, and this is in, a, in an environment which the Buddha designed himself, so it's kind of an ideal um, community, then there's the idea of taking responsibility, um, non-concealment of offenses, and uh, having committed an offense, then making the, the commitment to refrain from such action in the future. And, and misbehavior certain, um, amongst the Sangha, and this is in a severe or gross um, non the, the monk is given the chance to uh, make a fresh start by going on a period of, of penance with special practices. Refrain from such action in the future. Uh, but when, when certain eventually when he's rehabilitated and gives the community at large a sense that um, there is recognition uh, of, the of the period of, of, something of penance with special practices to, um, to amend it. But then if someone is uh, goes beyond the, the boundaries of what's acceptable for a, a summoner, then that's the end he has to leave. So there is that kind of um, strictness and or, or um, absolute kind of um, decision making so you know a monk who if, if we consider the Buddha as like ocean like compassion with you know with no boundary at all uh, and yet if a monk commits one of the four defeat or parajika offenses he's not forgiven in the sense that he can come back and become a monk again I mean he's forgiven and the, the Buddha doesn't hold a grudge against him, obviously, um, but that he's for, forfeited his, his right in this lifetime to, to live in this way. So on a personal, so that's how, how the Buddha is seeing it on a, on a social level. On a, in, but in terms of uh, the Buddha himself, then there is the, the quote, uh, the, the passage where the Buddha says that his feeling towards Rahula, his son, is exactly the same as his feeling towards Devadatta. So there, there's no difference in his feeling. So there's that absolute refusal to make distinctions between uh, human beings that no matter their conduct or their behavior towards the Buddha in the past, then... Um, his feeling towards them is unaltered, un unalterable. 
and so that's that's the goal you know for so the buddha is is like our exemplar and 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 that's the standard that one tries to to move towards as a buddhist yeah. thank you ajahn i'm um, i'm just a bit conscious conscious of time and there are multiple questions that has uh, flown in so i thought i will um, start asking the questions from the floor um, if, and if you can address them please so the first question is um, so dear tanajan can you please share some teachings on giving and loving it's easy to give to those we love but not not so to those we disagree with how can we bridge the divide between the two sorry what was the beginning of the question the so um just it's it's like can you share some teachings on giving and loving feeling. because it's giving and loving yeah because it's is very easy to give to the people that we love but then on the other side it's a bit more difficult and how can we actually breach um, the division between the two well that is the you know the goal uh, of practice and giving and sharing is you know the fundamental way of um of, of bridging the gap between oneself and others um interestingly the um can't remember his name now so an american um statesman who had a um a very um inveterate enemy in the in the congress or the senate so i can't remember the details of this story but um this man was a a great lover of books and so the um it might be stuart mill or someone like that and so he asked his enemy whether he could borrow a book from him he'd heard he had this particular book and he was very keen to to read it and so this man gave him uh the book to read and that was the beginning of their reconciliation because once you've given something to somebody you can't look on them in the same way anymore and that person that enemy of his once he'd given him a book and shared it he couldn't sustain that same level of anger and hatred so giving is a very uh, profound thing you know it's it's an activity it's like a fundamental buddhist practice and it's a practice which gives rise to what what in modern day um we would call self esteem because when you give something you automatically become a giver and that that understanding of yourself is i am a giver means i am something somebody with something to give and that's the basis of of self respect you know that being someone who has something to give and someone who does give so um undermining or or working on this the sense of liking this person and not liking that person is is giving is a, is is a very good way to start but the the practice of the brahma viharas of metta um where you start off with uh, metta for yourself and then you you like it's you 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 light a little flame and then you take care of that and you expand to the people that you love and people that you care for and then to the um neutral people and then to um finally to people you don't get on with so this this is the the inner way of changing your your attitude to people around you here ajan i will move on to the second question so can ajan kindly comment on why there is so much violence in buddhist countries like myanmar sri lanka and thailand what would be the role of the buddhist sangha in these countries and also the lay buddhist communities well i um 
I don't know that there is a lot of violence in those countries. Um, all I know is what you read and hear in the media, and I'm I'm very skeptical. There can, there may be, may not be. I really don't know. So I'm not taking it as a, as a given that uh, the premise of this this question is is um, is, is correct. Um, but as I mentioned before, there uh, human beings are human beings, and their religious affiliation doesn't always um, enter into their uh, their calculations when they act, and particularly if they are not practicing the eightfold path and not learning how to um, be mindful of their actions of body, speech, and mind, they're not committed to precepts, they're not committed to this training, then it doesn't seem strange to me at all that they should act um, violently on occasion. I would say in, in, in Thailand that the, the tolerance for people of other religious persuasions or of other different is probably the, I would say, unrivaled anywhere in the world. Um, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And um, until there is admittedly um, problems in the south of Thailand, there's insurgency and there is violence. But I, I would doubt very much whether the, uh, the Thai um, Buddhists who act immorally in the, in, or violently are doing so in the name of Buddhism at all. Um, it's, not a, it's not a Buddhist Muslim conflict in the eyes of, of most um, Thais. So in, in, no, in those kinds of situation, there, there isn't that sense of um, religious conflict. Like Buddhism not being a religion based upon belief in dogmas has never rejected other religions or sought to get rid of them or to convert people who belong to minority religions. There is, um, at least in, in Thai Buddhism, this recognition, well, yeah, you have different beliefs, you have different ideas, but um, if you're a good person, then you'll go to heaven. That's, that's the kind of basic kind of village Buddhist um, belief, you know, that it's how you act, how you behave to others, how you live your life that decides what happens after you die, not what religion you belong to. And this, is, um, this, this can be borne out by the lack of persecution of religious minorities in Thailand throughout history. And if you compare with 16th, 17th, 18th, even 18th century Europe, the, the contrast is, is a stark one. And the, I think it's one of the, the proudest achievements of um, Buddhist societies, in, uh, in, particularly in Thailand, that, that uh, there's never been that kind of religious persecution because it's alien to the whole way of, of Buddhist culture and understanding. But there are ethnic and um, political uh, conflicts, and there are economic conflicts, and, and sometimes they are characterized as um, religious conflicts, and I'm not sure that that's always the case. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So this isn't such a um, clear answer, maybe. But I would say, first of all, that it's very important that we always um, remind ourselves that we don't really know what's going on. I mean, I've been a, a Buddhist monk in Thailand for over 40 years, and I have still feel I have a very limited view of um, 
of what goes on because I try to keep very strictly to what I know as a direct experience. And I think that in, in the last 10 years, there was a general feeling in the West that Buddhism's had a kind of an easy ride, that people were idealizing Buddhism um, as a religion of peace and comparing it unfavorably with Christianity and Islam. And it was a bit of a kind of a backlash and a lot of articles written and books written, well, you know, these Buddhists, they're supposed to be so peaceful, but did you know that it's really like this and like that? So I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about that and the intentions behind that, that whole wave of, of um, articles and, and, and the stuff that came out. So I, I'm, not, I'm not meaning in any way to um, gloss over things that happen with Rohingya people or in, in Sri Lanka. Um, I'm sure that there, you know, there are things going on there, but these are these are complex phenomena, I would say. And the um, people who live on—I was born on an island, so I, I feel I'm I'm qualified to say people who who are born on islands are a little bit weird. Um, there's a spe specific kind of um, psychology for people. Who live on islands, and and so I'm uh, I'm making a, a comment about Sri Lanka here. You know, this sort of the, the some of the conflicts there. This is like island people conflicts. Um, so um, yeah, I don't feel I'm an expert enough to make any really qualified, um, authoritative comments about what's happening in Buddhist countries. But I would say that. It's very difficult. Uh, you have to be really, um, I don't know, uh, ingenious to find some backing in Buddhist scriptures to justify any kind of violence. So do I understand correctly that, Ajahn, so even if our intention is to defend the Dharma, we shouldn't resort to using... Uh, like violence or force, is that, is that right? I'm not saying should or shouldn't. I mean, it's quite clear that if you act violently, then you're creating bad karma. So it's up to you. Do you want to create bad karma or not? There's to be um, it results in, in suffering, but that's your choice. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, another question is that as a lay person, how can I stay open-minded, kind, and compassion when witnessing ignorance of those who are in power to sufferings of people and brutal oppression of those who do not share the same political views? First thing, don't watch the news so much. Um, these days, um, if you're looking at your screen many times during the day and you're seeing all these distressing um, things that, that upset and, and depress you, fill you with anger and helplessness, and the question is, why? Why do that? Um, if you want to keep um, in touch with what's happening, that's your responsibility as a citizen. I, I would agree that's, that's a good reason to um, look at a, a, an update or a summary of news once a day for a few minutes. But the question is why, why looking at things and listening to things throughout the day? You know, what, what exactly is the purpose behind that? It's not giving you any more knowledge or understanding of what's going on or any um, any ideas about what can be done about it. It's just um, uh, upsetting you unnecessarily. So I'd say that I'm not, I'm not saying turn off all the news and, and don't take any, any notice of what's going on. That's not what I'm saying, but saying ask yourself how much news um, should I watch in a day? What's the, what's the optimum amount that I need to watch? And and uh, what are my viewing habits? So the um, 
all media is is skewed is is prejudiced to to one degree or another or 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 other it's not going to be um completely uh, objective so you are opening yourself to the perspectives and prejudices of of others at the same time when you when you watch listen to news so being aware of that as well but again it's it's a matter of spending a little more time meditating and reflecting and um developing that mindfulness and then you know openness and compassion they they don't come about through an act of will it's not you can't just decide to be open minded or compassionate but these these qualities grow naturally when the mind is um cultivated in, in line with the eightfold path and the the connections and the um this the ability to feel compassion for people um who are on the other side of the divide or if you take a side in a war then there's been there's incredible amount of of suffering and distress on on the other side um as well it's not just a one-sided thing and and being able to to recognize that you, you say when you if there's any kind of dispute or conflict in society on whatever grounds then it's really good practice to um to try to find out who is the most articulate and intelligent representative of the view that you disagree with and then listen to them or read them and read them and see what they have to say try to expose yourself to opinions that you disagree with every now and again and perspectives that you're not familiar with so that you avoid that um tendency just to always be listening to people who have the same idea as you do um i think i've asked all the questions um from the floor but if i've missed any please um please type in your uh, question into the chat box but um may i just uh, please um ask one last question from from myself at least ajan what can we buddhist as a com- community offer to the world um as well i don't know whether there is there is such a thing as a buddhist community um throughout the world but i i would say that common sense <laughs> kindness um and yeah the ability to uh to listen to all sides of an argument and to and uh, not to be carried away by our emotions but to uh, recognize emotion as emotion and thought as thought um you know this is the buddhist um insight you know the body is the body feelings are feelings perceptions are perceptions thoughts are thoughts consciousness is consciousness um we are all companions in birth old age sickness and death no one wants to suffer everyone wants to be happy um these you know we have we have these basic truths of of human experience that are verifiable and the i think it is generally acknowledged throughout the world that in, in buddhism we have some very uh effective practical techniques for um working with the mind and sharing those it would be uh, mindfulness practices and um loving kindness practices forgiveness practices and so on so i uh, i'm not sure that there is like a stage on which the buddhist community can can share this but i think you know we all have our own individual world our own um society our own group of family and friends and to try to embody the buddhist values in our own conduct and in the way that we talk about the world and the way in which we think about the world and just to be um as good example as you can be in in your own 
small world? There is a, a question that just came as we talk. Um, that dear Long Po, I heard that people are often not aware of violences we do to ourselves. Can you please comment on that? Violence to Our, sorry, ourselves. Violence to ourselves, yeah. Um, well, yeah, from the. Um, this is not just uh, like a metaphor or, or a way of speech because there are people who are committing all kinds of violence against their, their bodies these days. And that can be from um, committing suicide or attempting to commit suicide. There are huge numbers of young people these days who cut themselves, particularly young girls. Um, there are people who are destroying their health through uh, various kinds of drugs. These are all acts of violence against uh, oneself and one's well-being. But the um, trying to um, deal with with your own problems and weaknesses by just saying you should be this and you shouldn't be that and you're a bad person because you think like that and you do like so that kind of really judgmental, nasty um, way of looking at yourself is, is a form of violence. So there can be the crude and um, physical kinds of violence through har physical harming and drugs or through uh, this very um, sort of judgmental attitude towards oneself that many people adopt. So these kind of violence... Um, are foolish and don't lead to any um, lasting resolution. So in terms of someone who is very critical of themselves um, because of things they've done in the past, for instance, I feel very guilty about them, then the, then I would say, consider if you say, I shouldn't have done this or I should have done that in the past and I was, why did I do this and why did I do that? I'm such a bad person. Then I would say that the reflection is, well, on that particular day, on that particular occasion, you, only, you had so much defilement in your mind and so much dhamma in your mind. The defilement was more than the dhamma. And so you did a stupid thing. It doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It just means that you need to reduce the amount of defilement in your mind and increase the amount of dhamma in your mind to prevent that happening again. So don't create this, this person, this, this bad person. Um, that's, that there's, there's no bad person that you can find. There are foolish actions. Um, and those foolish actions can be abandoned and you can act in a better way in the future. So you don't have to, um, to sort of be violent with yourself in terms of judging yourself and telling yourself you're a bad person. Um, it's all causes and conditions. And through practice of Buddha's Eightfold Path, um, you can find a way out of even the the worst maze and the deepest depression, but uh, you have to commit yourself to it. Mm. So someone else um, asked that uh, the Lord Buddha said that people fight each other because of sense desires. Can you please um, give us a short reflection on the link between violence and sense desire? Thank you. Well, when you want something, um, then you're immediately suffering because wanting something is suffering. And your attitude to other people changes immediately because other people are going to want the same kind of things that you want. So you're going to start looking at people either as competitors um, or else as prey, some people that you can take advantage of. 
so the the mind becomes uh, coarse and um, competitive when uh, when desire takes over the mind, and you're a fear. There's a fear that you're not going to be able to get what you want to get, and and you begin to um, give a, an excessive value to the thing that you want. It seems to become incredibly important, more important than anything else. And gaining the object of desire becomes so important that you become willing to compromise on your morality and your treatment of others and being even willing to commit acts of violence. So when the fulfillment of sense desires becomes um, central to your to your life and your your sense of um, self worth and meaning in life, then you're on the path to conflict and violence for sure. Thank you so much, Ajahn, for tonight's um, teaching. And um, I think we all now are quite clear on the the Buddhist perspectives on on peace and and non-violence. And tomorrow night, we will have Ajahn Kaoyano, who is the abbot of the Buddha Bodhivana Monastery in Melbourne, to tell us all about the Buddhist approaches to social reconcil reconciliation and healing. Before we end, can we um, please ask Ajahn to lead us all in the dedication of merits, please? Thank you. We shan't should imina or... There are different chants. Sorry? Shall I give a blessing? Uh, yeah, could do, could do. I, I give a blessing. I'm... Yata wari waha pura bari purin tisagarang E wami waito tinang pe tanang upakapati Jitang batitang dumhang kipa miwa samichato sapphe purento sankapa Janto panaraso yatha mani jyotiraso yatha sapitiyo ewa janto sabharoko Vinasato matem watvantarayon suki tikayuko pawa Apiwa dana si lesa nitjang wata pachahino Jataro tama watantia yuano sukang palang Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, thank you so much to um, everyone and let us all join our palms together again to pay our respect to Ajahn. And I hope everyone has a good evening and uh, thank you. Thank you.